Good evening. I'm, I was sharing. <laughs> Make sure you share too. Okay, let's see. Where's our... I'm trying to find the proper intro here. Okay, well, I can't find that intro <laughs> in the chat. I thought it would let me go back, but guess not. So we're just going to go ahead and get right into it. We got um, a lot to cover with these uh, transition metals. So we have maybe about uh, one more week's worth of this, I believe, and we'll be done. And then we're going to do our experiments and move into our new topic. I'm excited. So let me get my notes, get my notes, because it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. All right, so ruthenium. Um, <laughs> yes, that is a real name, all right? And um, it is the name uh, of the Latin name for Russia. So basically, <laughs> they named ruthenium after the uh, the Ural, uh, well, it's found in the Ural Mountains, it's mined from there, um, and it's actually... Uh, isolated from ore that is found in those mountains. So that's why they named it after Russia. <laughs> and um, its discovery is generally credited to uh, Carl Ernst Klaus in 1844. So like I said, a lot of these elements were discovered in like the mid to late 1800s because that's when people were in the big scientific discovery phase. And a lot of these metals that we'll be talking about today were actually found using a compound called aqua regia. Oh, excuse me, indigestion a little bit. <laughs> and aqua regia is basically a, a super acidic solution. So um, it is one part Yes, one part nitric acid and three parts hydrochloric acid. And so you add the nitric acid to the hydrochloric acid, like that's kind of like the acid mixing, pouring rule is you always add the smaller amount to the larger amount, never the other way around. So if you're adding, uh, if you're mixing water in the acid, then you will have the abundance of the water and you add the acid to that for uh, safety reasons because uh, reactions uh, can occur and um, cause things to spatter, catch fire, uh, produce all types of get, like there's all types of different like unsavory reactions you can get from not correctly mixing um, acid or um, at acidic solutions, like extremely acidic solutions, such as nitric acid, very strong acid, hydrochloric acid, very strong acid, um, sulfuric acid, hydrofluoric acid, like very, very, very uh, strong acids. So you have to be very careful with those because um, one time in in science lab, <laughs> I wasn't, and I ended up knocking over um, some sulfuric acid on my bench, and I threw a dry paper towel on top of it, and the paper towel burst into flames. Like, yeah. First, it was, like, kind of brown. I was like, oh, why is the paper towel brown? Like, I didn't know sulfuric acid was brown. It was brown because it was burning, all right? <laughs> and then once it started soaking up enough of the sulfuric acid, it just started to flame up. So, yeah, be very careful with that. Like, make sure you dilute it with water first and then wipe it up, um, that type of situation. And then some um, acids, and I believe aqua regia in particular, it is extremely corrosive. So you would actually have to add uh, sodium bicarbonate to it to neutralize it. Um, sodium bicarbonate is essentially baking soda. Baking soda, I got baking soda. So, okay, there are legal uses for baking soda other than baking. You can use it to neutralize very strong acids um, and be able to diluted with water after and um, dispose of it properly. So um, 
they dissolved this ore that they found in these mountains in Aqua Regia. So um, actually, this is this is not the Klaus dude. So not in 1844. Actually, 20 years before that, uh, this guy. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna murder these names. I'm gonna tell you this now. <laughs> Johns Berzelius and Gottfried Osheim, um, they actually found it in its impure form. When they say impure form and it's a transition metal, nine times out of ten, they found the oxide form of it and not the pure form. And we're getting into the very rare uh, transition metals. So for the most part, it's not going to ever occur in this whole natural pure form by itself like ever because it's so rare so you're pretty much always going to find these metals mixed in with other metals in this cluster so basically this cluster that we're going over today they tend to be found together in ores and um they tend to be uh in very 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 small amounts because a lot of these metals are so like so rare like um it's I don't know, like it's it's almost a miracle that they even found it in the first place. So, um, and we're gonna get a little bit more into that in um in a in a minute with one of these later ones because I actually stumbled across a news report of people stealing catalytic converters off of cars because of the money that they can get from selling them, and we're gonna talk about why. Okay, so uh, once they dissolved um. This oh, and Aqua Regis stands for Royal Water, so I thought that was kind of cool because you know, like they call it Royal Water, mostly because literally everything dissolves in it except for these metals we're going to talk about because they are extremely corros corrosion resistant, they are resistant to uh chemical uh. That's what, you know, corrosion. So they won't dissolve in acid, they're not easily melted down. Um, it takes like almost two hey. It takes almost uh, 2,000 to like 20, 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit to melt these metals and make them workable. Like that's how, that's how strong these metals are. And um, we'll be talking about some of the densest transition metals as well. This isn't one of them, but we're going to get to them. <laughs> Um, and its properties, um, it is a member of the platinum group. So pretty much all the ones that we're talking about is a part of the platinum group and you everybody knows something about platinum one way or the other most uh commonly in jewelry and um that's also why jewelry platinum jewelry is so expensive because platinum is a very rare earth metal um and uh this it makes compounds this particular uh element ruthenium makes compounds that are similar to cadmium compounds cadmium is not in the platinum group but it is in the 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 period. It's down the period from ruthenium, but it's not a part of the platinum group. So, yeah. Remember when we talked about period elements that are usually in the same period, they tend to have similar chemical properties. That is still true for transition metals for the most part. They like they're kind of the oddball, so they do have a some things that kind of differ and the trends aren't as clean as the ones that we talked about um, previously, but, uh, but they still, they still have some similarities there. It's a powerful alloying agent. So it's usually used to strengthen platinum and add a very, very um, high um, anti-corrosive um, properties to platinum. So um, that's usually what okay <laughs> um and then uh what do we have here so it can be plated by electro deposition or thermo de thermal decomposition method so electro deposition is basically where um is an it's electrified like it's you know in this thing and then because it's, it's electrified it ends up ionizing and you know the uh, the electrons snatch like literally pull the um the atoms of it onto the surface of whatever is being plated and thermal decomposition is basically just heating it to such high temperatures that um it pretty much vaporizes it so most of these uh elements that we're talking about today aren't prone to uh, vapor being, you know, vaporized. So like I said, really, really, really high temperatures. So, um, working with these particular metals tends to be extremely, um, energy, uh, uh, 
consumptive. So it takes a ton of energy, um, a ton of heat to work with these elements. But once you work with them, um, you get a whole lot of bang for your buck. So that's, you you know, that's kind of like the off, you know, the offset of, you know, the pros and cons, you know, when you're thinking about working with these type of metals. And it oxidizes. So it doesn't oxidize in air readily. So what that basically means is it, it doesn't rust. So it's not going to rust or stain very easily in the air. But once it finally does oxidize, uh, it's explosive. So, <laughs> um, so it has a very, very strong oxidizing reaction um, in under certain circumstances, and it generates a ton of heat when it does oxidize. So that's what oxidizing explosively means. It just basically means that it's combustible <laughs> under certain conditions. And um, it can be attacked. That's that's a sign. That's actually a scientific term. <laughs> so it can be attacked by halogens and hydroxides. Basically, meaning if there's if you put like one of these metals in like hydrofluoric acid, uh, for instance, like I said, um, uh, fluoride is a halogen. It is one of the most reactive halogens. And um, putting it putting one of these metals in with that meaning that the fluoride will jump if it's if even if it's in this uh it's hf it's happy so it's got its full a it will kick hydrogen to the curb and snatch up some of this ruthenium like that's how that's what attack means like when you think of attack like i think that's why i use that word because it is it's very descriptive of what is actually going on with these uh with these elements so yes it actually like mm, give me some of that ruthenium so that's how the fluoride acts with that and hydroxides do the same thing so sodium hydroxide is a very strong uh base so that means it fully dissociates in water into its ions, its sodium and hydroxide ions. So in the sodium hydroxide solution, or even if you probably just use uh, solid, because solid sodium hydroxide, it almost looks like, uh, I'm trying to think of like, like chalk, but not chalk. Like it's like smoother than, than chalk, but it's, it's this white as chalk, but it doesn't have the same like kind of texture look to it. It almost looks shiny. So, uh, yeah, and it usually has, it comes in like these little like pellets. It looks like little pellets. So, um, yeah, and that can, uh, solid sodium hydroxide will most likely react very readily with ruthenium as well. And um, as far as its uses goes, like I said, it's used to harden not just pal uh, platinum, but also palladium. So we'll be talking about both of those today as well. And um, and it's usually alloyed with these to make electrical conductors that are extremely wear resistant um, and um, meaning that they're resistant to corrosion, um, uh, heat um, corrosion as well, because uh, with metals, if they get hot for too long or hot for longer than, you know, some period of time, they tend to break down, degrade and um, lose their uh, their usefulness. The corrosion resistance of a titanium ruthenium alloy is improved 100 fold. But this is not, that's not the kicker. So 100 times more uh, corrosion resistant by adding 1,000. 1,000. So 0.1% ruthenium. So if you have, let's say, one gram of a platinum, I mean, of a titanium ruthenium alloy, then only one thousandth of a gram of that is ruthenium. And you've already improved this corrosion resistance by a hundred times. Like, so as you can see, even though these, uh, these elements are extremely rare, they're rare because you don't need more than what, what we got. Like what we got is exactly enough for what we need. So I think that's pretty awesome. You know, like, don't even have to measure, like, don't have to, like, measure too much. Like, mm, they only need a little bit of this because it's, like, super great. Like, all you need is, like, barely a drop of it in whatever you need. And it's already, like, just made these super metal alloys and stuff out of nowhere. So I thought that was really cool about that. And a lot of these other elements have the same um, characteristics. Um, let me see. So now we're moving on to rhenium. So 
these these first couple ones they don't have a whole lot going on with them but uh platinum of course like i said every everybody didn't heard of some platinum so platinum definitely does have a lot more um more uses and there's more research being done with it as well as far as um who wow so <laughs> rhenium comes from the Latin term Renus, meaning Rhine. Um, I'm assuming this is the Rhine River. It didn't go into detail. That's just what it said about the name. <laughs> and um, Rhenium is generally considered to have been discovered by uh, Walter Nodak, Ida Tack. I'm, like I said, I'm probably not pronouncing these people's names right at all. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm ahead of time. I'm going to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Otto Berg in Germany um, in 1925. So they detected the element in platinum ore and columbite as well as in gadolinite and molybdenite. So we've talked about some of these ores, uh, especially like molybdenite because molybdenum, it was isolated from that ore as well. And um, I think uh, gal gallium, might have also been isolated from gadolinite. So that's what I'm saying, like a lot of the, especially the rarer elements, they tend to be found with other transition metals or transition metal ores or uh, metal ores in general. So um, yeah, it makes sense, right? You know, birds of a feather flock together. So, you know, they hanging with their rare earth metal crew. And um, this, has uh rhenium has a very high density like extremely high density i believe this one is the one that they were talking about is it is it this one i might have to recheck my notes on that one but um it's almost like twice as dense as uh iron so yeah that's pretty dense or maybe three times as dense because i want to say as density is like 22 something and irons is like seven something so yeah so it's commonly used in electrical contact material and um, rhenium wire is used in flash photography. So uh, I believe it was another metal that we had talked about maybe a week or two ago that had that same property. So they tend to either use or substitute um, these different um, metals in for the same purpose, because like I said, they're extremely rare. So um, you don't want to use it, you know, use it all up for one thing. So they tend to uh, find other, you know, other metals that can do the same, the same job um, without being used up so much. And it is used in hydrogenation of fine chemicals. So hydrogenation is basically adding hydrogen atoms to something. And, um, and as an additive to tungsten and molybdenum based alloys. So uh, yeah, we talked about tungsten. Yeah. Tungsten was the SB. <laughs> the SB, the, the other one that had like uh, a name or a, an original name and then it ended up getting this name changed. So the, the name that we call it isn't the same name as its chemical uh, symbol, which is, you know, SB. And... Um, so that's pretty much the extent of where rhenium comes in. Like I said, these are uh, so rare that they're not really using a whole lot of things and they can't really study it a lot because there's not a whole lot of it. So it's like once they found a good use for it, they was like, okay, that's cool. We can, we can go ahead with that. And um, so osmium comes from the Greek term osme which means smell, scent, or odor. And that's because osmium text, text, tetroxide, look, my, no, tongue tied. <laughs> osmium tetroxide, see, I did it again. Osmium tetroxide is highly toxic and it's a very powerful oxidizing agent, but it has a really, really, really strong odor to it, like funky, like real funky. So, 
that's where the um the term osmium comes from because like i said most of these metals were isolated in their oxide forms first and then purified from that point so if you isolate some real funky you know stinky compound you're gonna call it stinky okay <laughs> hey little stink stink <laughs> And so it was produced as a byproduct of nickel refining. And so this is actually pretty common, especially with ore and metal refining. Um, way back in the day when there were a lot of metal refining plants and stuff all over the world, like not just America. America had a lot of them, but there were a ton in the areas where most of these ores were being mined, which is mostly like South America, um, parts of Asia, like near the mountains and um, in Africa as well. And so, you know, that's where a ton of air pollution and stuff was coming from because of these metal refineries that were um, burning and uh, doing things to isolate and purify these ores that they found and separate the metals out. And so you end up with a bunch of stinky gases, um, a whole bunch of toxic oxides that end up getting thrown into the atmosphere, rain clouds form and catch it. And then now you're getting acid rain. So that's where acid rain comes from. Um, that stuff. <laughs> so oops, excuse me. once again, this is another one that was isolated from uh, from crude platinum. So crude platinum is basically unrefined platinum. It's not pure platinum. It will have impurities and things in it. And so that is dissolved in, once again, aqua regia. And then there was some stuff left over. And they're like, what's the stuff that's left over in there? And then they went to work on the stuff that was left over and found out it was osmium. Kind of sounds like society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, this is also uh, one of the densest elements in the world, has the highest melting point and the lowest vapor pressure, meaning uh, like it doesn't vaporize well. That's what vapor pressure basically means. Like it's not going to create a whole lot of vapor to have a pressure. <laughs> um. And uh, it's, oh, I said that. But um, because of its density, it's often alloyed with other precious metals to make products such as instrument pivots, phonograph needles. We don't really have phonographs anymore unless you like uh, like Marley King and the rest of the, uh, the Rock True Beats uh, crew that like to spin records. So uh, the, the phonograph needles, they don't call them, do they still call them phonographs? I don't think so. But <laughs> but like turntables, so if you have like a, a old fashioned like styled turntable with the needle and stuff, then um, the needle is more than likely made out of osmium and um, electrical contact. So once again, like the stuff that like actually hits the surface, um, so they it doesn't corrode and melt from the heat of the electricity when things are in use. And um, when it's naturally combined with iridium, it is used in fountain pen tips. So that, like, when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay, that explains so much. Because if you get, like, a real fountain pen, like, a real fountain pen, you're not going to find, a, a, like, a, a real fountain, even if it's not, like, a real nice one or, like, real extravagant one for, like, less than $100. And that's why, because you have these expensive rare earth metals in the metal tips of those. And um, the, te the tetroxide that's obtained from the powdered or spongy form of the metal. So uh, when these metals are isolated from these ores, they tend to be isolated in their pure form first as a powder or, as I said, a spongy form. So it's not quite a hard metal that we see. It's like in this kind of grainy type uh, brittle form. And then it has to be superheated and melted down into uh, the metal to either roll it into uh, wire or flatten it out into sheets or add it into a mixture with another metal to create the alloy. And it can be used, so these powders can be used to detect fingerprints and stain fatty tissues uh, from microscope slides. Now for iridium. 
So iridium, the name iridium was derived from the Greek word iris for rainbow. And this refers to the various colors of its compounds. So like I said, the transition metals are fun because their oxide compounds make very colorful solutions. And um, that's that tends to um, be the source of, of their naming pattern for the most part. But um, like I said, some of them were named for where they were found or who found them and, you know, things like that. But I've, I've noticed the big trend with these is that they're named after colors or coloring of some sort. Um, it was discovered by several chemists actually uh, around the same time. So independently, these people were doing work with these ores and ended up finding this compound at about the same time um, in 1803. So um, the English chemist, so this, this is actually the same guy that found um, rhenium. Is that rhenium? We can, we can scroll back up in the notes and make sure. Oh, no, not rhenium. That was the first one, ruthenium. Or was that osmium? Yes, osmium. Yes, so the British chemist Smithson, Tennant, he did osmium and iridium. And then he actually has like um, a partner. I forget his name, but his name, it'll come up in one of the later ones. But they also discovered that one too. So it makes sense. Like if these elements are tend, they tend to occur together. And then you get a piece of ore that has several different elements in it that haven't been found. You go and go to separate them, then naturally, as you start working your way through the parts of this ore that you have and that you're separating and purifying, you're going to find these elements. So that that makes sense. <laughs> but one of these had like a little bit of drama around its discovery. We'll get into that a little bit. So um, iridium is the most corrosion resistant element. Oh, did I say this guy? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's it's just so it was actually like I said, it was a couple of uh scientists. So Smith's and Tennant is the one that usually gets the credit for it, but the other uh chemist is uh, a French chemist named H. V. Colette Discotil. I'm I'm ruining the name, I promise you. <laughs> um AF for Croy and N. L. Vauquillin. All are said to have found iridium in the acid and solub soluble residues of platinum ores. But the first guy usually got the uh, credit. Um, iridium is the most corrosion resistant element on the periodic table. So this one is like, there's no acid that like can put a burn on it. Like, I don't, I don't know if that's a thing, but it's a thing for iridium. All right. <laughs> and um, just from this, uh, this, hardness of it is really really hard to work with um in machines like to like you know beat it and pat it out so it has to be heated to extremely high temperatures like i said some upwards of like 22 2500 degrees fahrenheit so like really really high. i'm not even sure how they get stuff that hot but they do it and that's about the only way that they can work with this metal and um and measure it so because of that, it's used to set standards and weights and measures because it's it's not going to uh, change in different pressures, temperatures. Um, so when metal tends to uh, be warmer, it expands. When it's cooler, it uh, contracts. This metal, because it's so hard and it's not really um, conducive to those type of temp temperature uh changes it doesn't do that so it's used as to set the standard for weights and measures if you're measuring a length um and i believe this one oh yeah it is so uh because it's so very resistant to corrosion the standard meter bar so if you i don't know like the length of a meter uh <laughs> like it was made from uh, an alloy of platinum, so 90% platinum, 10% iridium, and uh, eventually the bar was replaced uh, as the definition of a meter in 1960. 
Um, but the meter was redefined in terms of orange red spectral line of Krypton. So Krypton, we talked, we talked about Krypton. It's a part of the noble gases. So Krypton, um, when it's, I, I believe, I'm guessing when it's like lit up with some type of radiation or light or something hitting it, it makes this orange red line that has uh, a certain length. So it has an exact length and that's what was replaced uh, as the meter uh, standard. Um, but where were we at? The prototype of the kilogram. So, um, Kilogram, that's weight, how much something weighs. So the inter, the international uh, metric system is actually the scientific system for measuring and things like that. So uh, outside of the U.S., not too many people use like pounds, ounces, like that type of thing. That's something we do here. Cups, tables, people don't do that. They usually say um, a gram and a kilogram is just a larger measure of grams. Um, and so the standard for that is made of platinum, uh, a platinum iridium alloy, and that one is still being used. And so, what did I? So its principal use, so its main use, is to harden platinum by making that platinum alloy, and um, it's also used to make devices needed in high temperatures and in electrical contact. So like I said, when you have like really, really thin wires, like as we saw in the iron experiment, the iron, uh, the iron, what was that? The little fluff experiment where we set the, the, the iron wool on fire, um, fire, that was called fire iron, I think. Um, because it's so thin that when um, really high temperatures or fire or things like that get to it, it make it's that much more combustible. How because it doesn't have the the big iron surface to transmit that heat to to keep it from burning up. So uh, in cases like that, you add uh, these really really hard um, metals to it to increase the temperature and corrosion resistance. And um, it's also used in some optical lenses. So like um, cameras and, and things like that, that's what an optical lens is. Or um, even like uh, little pointer things like, you know, telescopes and things like that. So to reduce glare. So it just depends on what the lens is being used for. I'm assuming mostly for like photography because you don't want glare on the lens because then it gets like the weird eye thing in pictures or something like that. <laughs> and um, a compound of osmium and iridium is called osmoridium. I think that's a pretty name. Like that's pretty to me, osmoridium. <laughs> and um, that is used in fountain tips. So <laughs> like I said, we talked about osmium and now we're at iridium. So both of these are extremely rare and the tip of your expensive fountain pens are osmoridium. And that's why they cost so much because it's made from uh, there. And when I say rare earth metals, I mean like super rare. Like it's almost like uh, the collective amount is like dust, like specks of dust in my hand like that's why you only need like barely like a bloop and an alloy to make it like to extend its properties like almost a hundred times like super cool and it's also used to uh make super strong jewelry and um and so iridium is added to platinum and an alloy to make unbreakable chains <laughs> <laughs> unbreakable chain what that now you can get like real like philosophical with people like yeah i got these unbreakable chains man it's like this an iridium alloy in it or something <laughs> they go like what what are you talking about tell them rock watch some rock true science and they'll and they'll get where you what you uh they'll pick up what you laying down <laughs> so <laughs> palladium 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 is actually named after a meteor asteroid asteroid called Pallas and uh this is actually the second largest asteroid and this particular one was actually visible from earth just looking up in the sky uh back in 2014 so I think that's pretty cool like and we do there's media showers that pass in the sky all the time like people was calling like shooting stars but stars don't move 
meteors do though. So if you see one, it's if you see a uh, like flaming light with a tail and stuff, it's probably an asteroid, not not an actually moving star. I think there's a couple of those that are still like hanging around, but those are like dying. I think that I think they said those are dying. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been a minute since I watched that uh that that show about the the universe and the stars and stuff. But I I definitely like to nerd out on stuff like that because it gets real interesting. And uh, it's also a remnant. So the the asteroid itself, Pallas. So Palladium was named after the asteroid Pallas, but Pallas was uh, named after the Greek goddess Pallas Athena. And um, so they named Palladium after Pallas, which had just been discovered the year before this element was uh, discovered. So this element was discovered in 1803 and um, William Hyde Wollaston. So Wollaston was like one of those scientists that had a personality. <laughs> OK, so uh, <laughs> he was an English chemist. And so instead of just announcing like, hey, I discovered this element, um, he actually ended up uh, making like a game of it. And he was like putting out flyers saying like, hey, it's this little it's this new element. Y'all want to buy some? Like he was basically like selling it before people knew what it was. And so uh, his one of his like rivals or whatever was like low key hating on him. Was like, oh, he didn't really discover nothing. Like it's not even a real element. He just making up stuff. And then when he announced at like some scientific summit, uh, you know, about all of the facts about how uh, this element was isolated, its properties, and things like that. Then at the end of that speech, he announced like, and I was the one that discovered it. Boom. So, <laughs> so I like I like the way he did. There was like. Like, yeah, why you hating on me? <laughs> I'm the one that found it. Like, but he do wasn't like particular like directly hating on him because he didn't know that he was actually the one that found it. So he just thought that he was promoting, you know, this thing that didn't exist. And um, so this was also was this one dissolved in Yep, Aqua Regia. Here we go again. So that's why I gave y'all like the definition of what Aqua Regia was when we first started this, because basically all of these were um, isolated from using Aqua Regia to dissolve the Orion. And then, you know, the scientists just picked through the stuff that didn't dissolve and was like, oh, this is weird because this dissolves everything. So then they found out it didn't dissolve everything because these are like the most dense elements on the face of the earth. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so it makes it extremely corrosion resistant and resistant to chemical. Um. So this, this is where it gets interesting. All right. So on August 18th in 2014, palladium's price hit $900 per, per troy ounce. That's don't ask what that is. I don't know. It's probably some standard measuring unit for price and stuff in somebody's market somewhere. <laughs> um, and that's the highest seen since 2001. So in 13 years, that's highest as it had ever been. So that particular year, the political instability in Russia sent palladium prices to $1,125 per troy ounce. So this is from an article in the Wall Street Journal. So that being said, and this is only like mm, seven years prior to, so the price is not going to drop like that much in that short amount of time, especially because palladium is rare. Like it's extremely rare. So because guess what your catalytic converters are made of? Well, it's not completely made of it, but your your catalytic converters have these extremely rare metals in them. Palladium, rhenium, and I believe ruthenium uh, are some that, that tend to be used in there as the plating on the inside of there to further the combustion reaction to not put so much smog out into the air. So um, because of that, there has been like, especially during the pandemic, while, you know, people have lost jobs need money, all kinds of stuff. There has been a spike of up 300% increase in the theft of catalytic converters off of people's cars. So that being said, 
watch where you park your car. If you do not have an enclosed garage or somewhere that has some type of security or that makes it difficult for people to get to it, protect your car. All right. There's uh, like little casings and things that you can get attached to the bottom of your car that covers your uh, catalytic converter and makes it take more time to get it off of there. Somebody got yours. Oh, see, man. Yeah, I had I saw it on the news probably like a week or two ago. And I was like, really, they doing that? And it's and it, they, you know, of course, social media, people out with their phones. Somebody had like recorded on their phone these two guys stealing one off of a car like they had the look they had the side of the car jacked up and they was under there with a blowtorch and they would they would burn they would cut the end that's attached to the back like the muffler part the part that goes to your muffler and then they would take like um a socket wrench or something and unscrew the, the bolts that connected to your engine and then just take it out and so they were saying that um i believe it's like uh pontiac it's one of them little bucky cars, you know, them little them little poop poop cars uh, that is really easy to get these off of. And so they were mainly targeting those type of cars because it's so quick and easy to get them off. Other cars tend to have like extra stuff on, you know, in the way, um, little coverings and cases. They did it. I bet they did because they don't have to be careful. All they need is the is the the converter part because that's where the the rare metal is. They don't need they don't actually need the converter to work. <laughs> they just need the stuff that's in it. So yeah, that's that's you know, they made it when you have a simple need then it makes it a, a easier job. And so um, yeah, protect protect your car, protect your catalytic converter because it is it's it's priceless. If you have a car that you're getting rid of, don't just trade it in because lo and behold, especially if you trade in a car that does not, um, that doesn't run that like the transmission or something went out on it, like, or the engine is like some where it's like, it will cost more than the car to get it fixed. Don't just trade your car in because nine times out of 10, they're not going to do nothing with your car, but sell like the stuff for scrap. And then they're going to get all of that money back because guess how much your catalytic converter is worth. You can get what, like three or $700 for it. If, and that's just going online somewhere. So that's probably already more than what, if you, if your car is like broke down that bad, like, and you pay cash for it, just probably half of what you paid for the car in the first place. So yeah. Be mindful. Be mindful. Because they out, they out here trying to get you and they not trying to put you up on game. So you see how science just worked out for you? Mm, okay. <laughs> and um, so because palladium doesn't tarnish in air, it's great for jewelry. So uh, since um, 1989, though, however... The main use of palladium has been, like I said, in catalytic converters for cars because there was a great big um, air pollution problem from the increased uh, use of cars. And so the way a combustion engine works is you put in gasoline, which is some type of like methane, ethane. So methane is CH3. So you have CH3 and then combustion means you add in oxygen. So oxygen comes into the equation and then combustion occurs, some heat is expended, and then the byproducts of a clean, excuse me, of a clean combustion reaction is CO2 and water. But the problem with the thing before catalytic converters is the, the products weren't CO2 and water. The products were CO2, water, and some messy little, uh, like methane, ethane type byproducts and like weird mess that was extremely uh, pollutant, you know, to the air. And so um, they ended up having like this big, like I believe it was like a worldwide like initiative where they like really cracked down on the make, the make of these cars and stuff. And so because of that, um, catalytic converters have uh, increased in like need and the materials needed to make them has increased. So the prices for all that stuff is a lot higher. So that's why if the catalytic converter goes out on your car, that's why it costs so much. It's not necessarily like the labor and stuff. And then I guess like they'll probably try and bust your head for that. But the catalytic converter is, is expensive by itself for that reason alone. So yeah, take care of your car. Stop putting stop putting cheap gas in your car. That's 
that's what it do with that 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 cheap gas. <laughs> the the uh <laughs> the one that you know probably got all types of uh extra impurities and stuff all in it. Like mm, I don't know. Re research your uh your favorite gas company and then find out how they refine they they gasoline and that'll probably give you more insight as to the quality of the gasoline you know they're selling. And um so these elements are so rare, water in it, all of that, all of that. And even though these these aren't uh, corrosive, if it's already water in the reactants, so the way chemical reactions work is you go from reactants to products. But if some of the product is already found in the reactant, then it's going to either slow down the reaction or it's not going to allow the reaction to go to completion because some of the product is already present. So uh, most chemical systems, unless there's some type of catalyst in there, the catalytic converter, don't go to completion. So you end up with an equilibrium. So it wants to find a happy balance. Everything on the planet needs to be balanced. So all the way down to the chemical level, and that's how chemical reactions work and are driven. So if the reaction doesn't have incentives to go from the reactants to the products, it's not going to. So the more products that are already present, the less the reaction is going to want to go to the products. So, and that's what a catalytic converter does. It makes the reaction more complete so that there's not this mixture of junk left over. And so all six platinum group elements put together make up only point oh oh how many O's is that? Three O's, point oh 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 five parts per million of Earth's crust. Like I said, like a handful of dust worth. Like, yeah. <laughs> and that's what's going in all of the cars. <laughs> So uh, most of them are found uh, in ore deposits formed by the cooling of magma. And so magma is lava or melted earth guts. So when volcanoes erupt, it shoots out hot stuff that came from the center of the earth. And so that's where a lot of these elements and things came from in the outer earth's crust. And um and also, uh, is that palladium or is that platinum? I might be getting ahead of myself. Mm. No, I think it was palladium. Uh, but one of the one of the researchers um, actually believed that the reason why these extremely rare earth metals are being found in the outer crust is from the impact of the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. So the impact was so great that it like it hit the center of the earth and it like made some of these like particles come out into the crust. So and that's why it's, it was in like it was in a concentrated area to the meteor hit and then it like spread it out. So now it's found like pretty much all over the, the earth in different like types of ore and then you you'll find it as you go and refine these ores and you'll get like little crumbles of stuff that don't fully dissolve or fully you know melt down at certain temperatures and things and it's probably that one of these elements and so this i thought this was a cool little fact so palladium's most incredible ability is that it can absorb up to 900 times its volume. Now, mind you, palladium is very rare. So it has like people, they're working with like crumbs of this stuff. 900 times its volume of hydrogen. And that's uh, according to the Thomas Jefferson National Accelerator Facility. So, uh the accelerator, the particle accelerator. I know if you watch the flash, you know, you know what I'm talking about. All right. So that's the actual thing, right? They built one and um, I believe it's just one on the face of the planet. Like that's 
It's just the one because it's so difficult to build. Like it has to be in a mostly geological stable place and like all types of stuff because, and it has to like form a super straight line from one end to the other. So like they had, it was all types of like the amount of effort that went into building it. They could only do it one time. <laughs> they were only willing to do it one time. So now when people need a particle accelerator, they go to that facility from wherever they are on the planet. If they need one, they got to go there for it because the conditions were, you know, uh, best for that and all of that. And so because of that, palladium is used to store and filter hydrogen. Ha! <laughs> And so the current research, Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Yes, that's the other one. Yeah, so it's two. Right. Okay, that's what I thought. So it's that one, the Jefferson National, and then the, yeah, the one in Switzerland. So, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> and and like I said, the main reason why they did this, not just like the geological stuff, but also because our country and Switzerland are like least likely to, to, you know, be ravaged by war. Like pretty much every other country has some type of like military something or war type of something going on in it, like on and off for the past like couple hundred years. So they needed somewhere that wouldn't um, accidentally get blown up. Because, yeah, that would suck. You spend like 50 years building something so precise and so, you know, practical and particular, you know, particular and precise just for it to be blown up. <laughs> like that would suck. And so palladium research is, uh, they're looking at it as, um, catalyst and fuel cells. So it's already being used in fuel cells, but, um, they're also looking at it, um, as, nanoparticles so not just like the actual metal but using nanoparticles of palladium to you know do the same job but cheaper because you're using much less of this very rare element and um so in this particular uh research uh in 2009 researchers created a 4.5 nanometer diameter palladium particles so these are like beyond microscopic uh, particles of this um, that remain intact four times longer than the particles previously available. So that makes sense because the smaller something is, the, uh, the what is it, the larger, I, I always get this mixed up. But uh, if you take a ball, its surface to volume ratio is, is uh, bigger than something that's smaller so a smaller uh orb or sphere has a larger surface to volume ratio than something big like it's I, it's something opposite like that i'll have to look that up and get back to y'all but i know it has something to do with that so if you're using nanoparticles then this same principle applies so you're getting a whole lot more bang for your buck when you're using much smaller particles and um, and so uh, it's another researcher. So they're using this also in um, cancer treatments. And um, is this is this what this guy is? Oh no, this one is about the catalytic converters. So it's this guy named Wong. They didn't give his full name. I don't think did they? Yeah, no, they didn't give his full name. So Wong and his colleagues, they found a way to use palladium gold nanoparticles as a sort of catalytic converter for water instead of exhaust. I know, right? <laughs> I love, like This is why I love science so much. So um, their lab has created a prototype for water, water filtration system that uses six foot tall columns of gold and palladium nanoparticles to remove nasty chemicals like carcinogenic uh what's this perchloroethylene so pce um a dry cleaning fluid from water so huh look at that we're we're clean we're cleaning water with it now and it, and like that's those are the type of um things that we're gonna have to like 
know how to do, especially on a large scale level, because our water is getting more and more polluted. And then, like I said, a lot of these uh, newer environmental regulations and things that are being put on these big companies, especially like uh, metal and oil refining um, industries and things like that, because they're they're the ones that pumping the most toxins into into the environment on all levels. Um, those regulations came like way too late. And then there's also, uh, you know, people that still do it, like sneak and do it. So eventually, like we're, we're not going to have, you know, drinkable sources of water anywhere. And um, we thought, you know, us being a, a first world country, you know, one of the richest, most powerful countries in the world that that would never happen to us. But lo and behold, Flint, Michigan still does not have drinkable water. Like the water is still trash. And a lot of that has to do with those uh, metal refineries. And like it was, they had a lot of like steel mills and stuff all along the lakes um, because it was easier to cool down those processes just running lake water through there. But they would just run that lake water right back out into the lake. And so, yeah. It ruined it ruined um, a lot of the drinking water. Um, thankfully, somehow, but that's why I don't get. I don't know. Somehow, Lake Lake Michigan isn't like completely jacked because I believe that's the main source of water for Chicago, and Chicago has drinkable water. So I'm not sure what that whole issue is. I think it has something to do with their pipes as well. So their whole like their whole water infra infrastructure is like is terrible. And um, they don't have enough money to change out like all of the the copper, not the copper. What is it? Lead pipes. They have like lead pipes and stuff still like and we all know like they don't even put lead in paint anymore. And they're still drinking. You know, they still have water that they're using from, you know, lead pipes. And even if you're not drinking it, bathing in it is not good either because your skin is the largest organ on your body. And um, so if you're submerged in this nasty water, like it's still, you know, going to pollute your body. So, you know, that's that's terrible. And that's why, you know, we, we need research and things like this to to find out how to, you know, how to help people in those types of situations, especially here. Like that's like that's so that's so sad. Like, how is it that y'all not funding this for them? Like, come on, federal government. get get your act together, get it together. All right. You can bail out these companies, but you can't send them money to change their pipes. Get, get your situation together. That's deplorable. So the, um, the technology that they made was the PG clear and it works kind of like a catalytic converter for a car, but it's used in, um, it's used for water. So, you know, they just run the water through and as the water is being run through the properties of this metal lined, uh, you know, receptacle pulls these impurities out of the water and um, literally catalyzes the, um, the purification process. And so they oh he and he explains that he says they take water con uh, that contains this PCE. So this dry cleaning fluid um, and it would just flow through this column of palladium and gold. And then those molecules bind to those nanoparticles of palladium and gold and become something else. <laughs> so <laughs> like and, they, and they're like and when they say become something else, that means they don't know what it turns into, but it's no longer a problem. I don't know. <laughs> And so then uh, now the clean water can be recycled and added back to where it belongs. And so researchers are also working to understand how palladium can absorb so much hydrogen. So that's something else that they're working on. And that was uh, MIT researchers doing that uh, in 2012. And um, they reported in the journal Materials Science Engineering that hydrogen drenched palladium warps under shear forces. So shear forces means uh, cutting. Yeah, cutting. When you cut metal is, yeah. Um, turning almost liquid-like. And the effect is far less pronounced when the metal is subject to tension forces. So pulling. Imagine stretching out the metal like, right, like taffy uh, versus bending it like a ruler. Like. So, um, 
the differing responses to sheer intention forces remain mysterious. So I don't know. Hmm, I guess. So because hydrogen, um, once it's like fully absorbed into this uh, palladium, it changes its uh, its hardness and properties. Like I said, palladium is one of the densest, hardest elements on the face of the planet. Like you're not going to be able to do nothing with it um, without using extremely high temperatures. And so I guess soaking it in hydrogen <laughs> can help change that uh, that effect. And so the last one, oh, so platinum is, uh, platinum got a lot going on. So platinum um, is actually, was actually used way back in ancient times. So people in Egypt and the Americas, so, you know, that tells you how far back that was. Um, used platinum for jewelry and decorative pieces, um, and it was often mixed with gold, excuse me, the first recorded reference to platinum was in 1557 when Julius Scaliger, an Italian physician, doctor, described a metal found in Central America that wouldn't melt and called it platina, meaning little silver. Because, you know, platinum is like super shiny and the first thing you think, oh, silver. Yeah, but no, it's way shinier than silver. <laughs> and um, so because of that, they called it the unmeltable metal. So that's like, that's pretty cool. But like, like I said, so are the other ones. So that's why these elements are called the platinum group because platinum doesn't like melt very easily. And, um, and it's also extremely corrosion resistant. And when uh, alloyed with the other platinum group elements, it becomes even more corrosion resistant and it's pretty dense. It has a, a really high density to its, uh, for its mass so it's not a uh, very heavy metal but it's extremely dense and um it's used oh, okay so this one is uh like i said also used in the uh, measuring standard for a kilogram and in the 1880s, about 40 of these uh, kilogram standard cylinders, uh, which they weigh about about 2.2 pounds or a kilogram, <laughs> were distributed around the world. And so, you know, they made the standards and then they gave them, you know, to, I guess, all the different countries so that they would have the standard to use for, you know, whatever scientific research and stuff so they can go to a place that, you know, keeps the standard and use it to, you know, compare their results and things. Platinum, iridium, osmium, palladium, ruthenium, and rhodium are your platinum group uh, metals. I don't know why it makes me itch. <laughs> and um, they all have pretty similar properties. Um, and like I said, they're all very dense, very hard, very corrosion resistant. Alloys of them um, makes it like a super metal, basically. And um, not a lot of the other ones are needed to uh, jack up the properties of platinum. So, like I said, they're like they're like the Avengers of metal. At oh my goodness, <laughs> the Platinum Avengers. <laughs> yeah, this is why you don't leave me in my head too long. <laughs> so they're uh, often used to make durable parts for machines, tools, and jewelry. Uh, platinum is used in several anti-cancer drugs. This is the anti-cancer element. All right. Um, because of its very low reactivity with um, our biological systems. And um, about 50% of cancer therapy patients currently use platinum-containing drugs, according to a 2014 study. So I'm not sure if that number has increased or what, but they do have some, some research that they're doing in that field as well um, concerning platinum and its uses in cancer drugs. Um, oh, it's also used in pacemakers. So pacemakers, dental crowns, and other stuff like that's in our body, like hip replace, joint replacements, and things like that. Pins, screws, plates, all that stuff. Because it was another metal that I talked about earlier, too, that was used as well. Um, and in place of chrome, chromium. Yeah. 
chromium alloy. So they tend to uh, alloy it with platinum as well. Mm -mm. I'm looking at these random facts I wrote down. I don't know why. <laughs> and so, um, oh, and this is another one. So I, I know a lot of people have like been looking at investing and stuff and like buying rare and precious metals and things like that. So uh, this is one of those little tidbits, uh, you know, many investors buy and sell platinum, even though the price can fluctuate greatly during economic growth and decline even more than the prices of other precious metals because it has so many uses. So um, it is probably like one of the most volatile materials to want to invest in. <laughs> but because it is like the thing with investing, the higher the risk, the higher the, you know, the gain. So um, that's why, you know, the people, I guess, who want to live life hard and fast on the edge, you know, they hop into the buying and selling of platinum. <laughs> and um, like I said, it's also used as uh, a catalyst. Uh, in catalytic converters uh, and as well in the production of um, fertilizers and plastics, gas, and things like that. Also in uh, fuel cells and um, yeah, and it just increases the efficiency of the process because a catalyst is uh, something that's not used up in the course of a reaction. So it's just there. It's like you walk into a room and stuff starts happening just because you're there, but it doesn't directly affect you and it doesn't necessarily interact with you, but it just does it because you're there. Like that's what platinum does. Like it's there and it's, stuff is just going and it doesn't have to go with any of the stuff for it to keep going. <laughs> And did I want to talk about this? Yeah, so a lot of the the research that's being done on uh, platinum, like I said, is the platinum containing drugs for uh, cancer and a platinum delivery system for said drugs and things like that. And so um, because of that research, um, the platinum producing industries have kind of uh, increased in, you know, their their production and things like that to keep up with the demand for it. But that's also driven the price of platinum up because of its, you know, potentially life saving use. And the instance of um, of cancer is actually increasing greatly as well. So uh, all of those things are are going into, you know, the price like the basic economic principle, supply and demand, all right? If you have a limited supply, you have a high demand, that supply is going to be extremely, uh, I'm weak. <laughs> he said my dad's fourth wife was a catalyst. Oh, a catalyst to, to move you around. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's all I have uh, <laughs> for these today. We're going to, hold on, let me. Grab it so I can tell y'all the last ones we'll be covering. So we have one more week of these uh, elements. And so next Tuesday on October 12th, we'll be talking about nickel, copper, silver, gold. Those are called what the, the coinage metals. I forget what they are. Coinage metal. That sounds right. Um, zinc cadmium and mercury. So that's going to uh, finish up our um, transition metal series. And then we'll be getting into our next topics. Um, I'm still kind of tossed up about where we want to go from there, but um, it's looking a lot like cell biology. Excuse me. Especially with what's going on in the world today, I feel like it's extremely... Um, pertinent now more than ever to be very aware of what our body is doing on a cellular level and how we interact with the world and how all of that is being affected by everything that's going on in the world and also the choices that we make with the things that we do to and with our bodies on a daily basis. So make sure you tune in 
because uh those other those other metals have some pretty some pretty big biological implications as well and um also some environmental implications and um yeah, and it's always fun. It's always fun to hang out with y'all. So make sure you tune in. If you have any questions, uh, bring them with you, and and um, I'll I'll try and answer them live. Otherwise, I'll look the answer up and I'll get back to you because I love doing research anyway. And uh, following up, uh, forty five minutes from now, uh, we have Rock True Beats. Uh, the host Marley King, Chris Lyon, he tuned in. Um, so he will be following up afterwards on Rock True Beats. Make sure you tune in for that because it's, it's always, always something like super scientific. Like you would swear that like we we plan how our shows sync up. We definitely do not. And it all just links in. So it's definitely like, you know, I come and massage the brain with the science. And then, you know, he, he comes with the reverb okay <laughs> with the reverb on your head now so make sure you tune in um at 8 p.m eastern 7 p.m central to rock true beats and i will see y'all next week and as usual rock truth or nothing at